Analysis of a Frame in an Airplane Hanger Under Wind Load Consider a small airplane hanger having a square base 36 meters by 36 meters and a pitched roof with an overall height of 13.3 meters. The hanger is located in an open terrain in a coastal area having a basic wind speed of 58 meters per second. The skeleton of the structure consists of seven frames spanning a distance of 36 meters. In this lecture, we wish to analyze the central frame due to the wind load only. More specifically, we are going to determine maximum bending moment, shear force, and axial force in each member. The frame has four members. Before we can analyze the frame, we need to determine the loads that wind exerts on the structure. Such determination generally is based on the governing design codes. Here we are going to use the American Society of Civil Engineers design code entitled Minimum Design Loads for Buildings and Other Structures. Herein we refer to it as ASCE 716. The code provides several procedures for determining wind loads. We are going to use the envelope procedure which works for regularly shaped low-rise buildings. Given that the hangar is located in an open terrain with very few obstructions around, wind velocity pressure for the frame can be computed using equation where V is basic wind velocity in meter per second. The coefficient 0.534 is the product of several factors given in the code for this particular scenario, including a topographical factor, a wind directionality factor, and an exposure coefficient. Given that the basic wind velocity is 58 meters per second, for velocity pressure we get How do we convert this pressure to frame loads? Here is how. Wind affects the walls and the roof of the hangar in several ways, each resulting in a different pressure profile on our frame. We need to consider all possible scenarios in order to ensure that the structural members can resist wind regardless of its direction. Generally speaking, wind causes external and internal pressures on the walls and the roof of the hangar. Externally, the windward side of the building is going to be subjected to positive pressure, meaning the wind is pressing against the wall, while the leeward side is subjected to negative pressure, meaning the wind creates a suction force at the wall. In our case, the roof of the hangar is also subjected to negative pressure since it has a relatively small inclination angle. According to the design code, we need to consider two principal directions for wind, east-west and north-south. Similar to the east-west direction, when wind travels in the north-south direction, positive pressure is exerted on the windward side, while the leeward side as well as the roof undergo negative pressure. Further, an internal pressure is formed when air gets inside the building or is sucked out of the building through its openings. If air can get inside the building faster at the windward side than it can leave at the leeward side, then a positive pressure develops inside the hangar. On the other hand, if there are more openings at the leeward side, if air can be readily sucked out of the building, then a negative pressure develops inside of it. Here we are assuming the building is enclosed, meaning we must keep the hangar door closed when high winds are present. The total pressure on the walls and the roof of the building then can be written as where Q is the velocity pressure and CE and CI are coefficients for external and internal pressures respectively. Since we already have calculated the wind velocity pressure, the design wind pressure can be written as we are going to consider two general load cases. Case A deals with east-west wind direction, and case B is for north-south wind direction. For a rectangular building with a gable roof of medium height of 11.3 m, 
CE for the exterior surfaces of the building is given in the design code. The coefficients are The positive value indicates the pressure is being exerted on the surface of the wall, and a negative value indicates the pressure is moving away from the surface, causing a suction force. The internal pressure coefficients are There is a positive coefficient of 0 0.18, and there is a negative coefficient of 0 0.18. This means we need to consider both positive and negative internal pressure in our analysis. Let's calculate the external and internal pressures affecting the structure. Since the frame carries only a part of the wind pressure on the walls and the roof, first we need to figure out how much pressure is exerted on each wall and each roof panel. Using the design pressure equation, we can determine the external and internal design pressures like this. Since the internal pressure could be either positive or negative, we are going to end up with two load cases, one in which the internal pressure is positive and one in which the internal pressure is negative. We refer to these as load case A1 and A2, respectively. For the scenario in which wind travels in the north-south direction, ASCE716 gives us the following pressure coefficients. And just like load case A, we determine two load cases, one for the positive internal pressure and one for the negative internal pressure. Since the design wind pressures are defined as force per unit area, we need to convert them into force per unit length before placing them on the target frame. The middle frame needs to be designed to support wind pressure exerted on 6 meter wide wall and roof panels. For example, in the case of load case A1, a pressure of 634 newtons per square meter is being applied to the left wall panel. To convert this to a linear load, we are going to multiply the load magnitude by the width of the wall panel. This gives us a uniformly distributed load of 3.8 kilonewtons per meter. Similar calculation can be performed on the right wall resulting in a distributed load of 1.94 kilonewtons per meter. Since the roof transfers its load to the frame via a series of beams, we first need to transfer the area load from the roof to the beams. This is done by multiplying the load magnitude by the distance between two consecutive beams. For the interior beams, this distance is 3.68 meters. The two exterior beams each has a smaller tributary area. For those two beams, we multiply the load magnitude by half of 3.68 meters. We then multiply the magnitude of each distributed load by 6 meters to determine the equivalent concentrated load that wind exerts on the frame through the beam segment. This gives us the following loads for the left side of the roof. For the right side, we need to obtain a similar set of loads. So for load case A1, we need to analyze this frame. Here are the loads for the other load cases. Let us analyze the frame for load case A1. We assume the frame is fixed at the base and all the members have the same section and material properties. I am going to assume you are familiar with the matrix displacement method since it was covered in previous lectures. To start, I'm going to write the stiffness matrix for each member. For member AB, we get For BC, we have, for CD, we can write, and for DE, the matrix is, we now combine the member stiffness matrices to get the system stiffness matrix. Here, the frame has 9 degrees of freedom. This means we end up with a 9 by 9 system stiffness matrix. We then transform the member loads to nodal forces. This is done member by member. 
by first calculating the member fixed end forces, then transforming the forces from the local coordinate system to the global coordinate system. That results in the following member end force vectors. Combining these vectors, we get the system force vector. Now our system equation is formed. We know the stiffness matrix. We just calculated the force vector, so we can solve the system for the unknown displacement vector. Knowing the end displacements for each member, we use the member equations to calculate member end forces. They are... Now that the forces in each member are known, we can draw its shear and moment diagrams. For member AB, we get... These are the diagrams for load case A1. If we go through the same analysis process for each load case, we can then draw the shear and moment diagrams for the member for all the load cases. Here they are. So for AB, shear reaches its maximum positive value under load case B1. Maximum positive moment occurs under load case A1. Maximum tensile force also occurs under load case A1, whereas maximum negative moment develops in load case B1. For member BC, our diagrams become... For CD, we get these diagrams. And for member ED, we get these. Given the diagrams for each member, we can easily determine the maximum and minimum forces and the load cases in which these forces develop. Here is a summary of the results of our analysis. This is based on the assumption that wind travels from east to west or from north to south. But what if wind could reverse direction? For example, what if we end up with a west to east wind direction? In such a case, the leeward and windward sides switch places, so we need to do a bit more analysis for determining maximum member forces. I'm going to leave that as an exercise problem.